How does boost add up with conventional or parallel twin turbos? And much more interestingly, how does boost add up with compound twin turbos or one turbo blowing into another? That one's real interesting. Let's find out. So I spent the last two years building Alex Labs. It now exists. Thanks for sticking with me through these dark times. But I've had to deal with a lot of contractor issues. I mean, take this wooden wall behind me. What is that? That's what needs power for my septic pump to run. That's why I'm having unhappy poopy time. So the Alex Lab side of the building exists as well, but it looks like this right now. But hey, I'm living in here and life is great and we can get back to doing videos on the regular. And you guys know my affection for the AI music generators. I decided I would try using AI to generate visual aids, if you will. They didn't really turn out very well, so we're gonna be looking at those pieces of art as, well, transitional pieces. Papa boost, baby boost. But when I do need like actual images of turbos, I just turn to my friend Bill Devine who owns Bullseye Turbo, or I believe he's one of the owners of Bullseye Turbo. And he knows a thing or two about turbos. He's got a Mustang that makes, oh, I don't know, 3,500, maybe a little bit more horsepower. It runs fours, like low fours. It may even be in the high threes in the eighth mile at like 190 miles an hour now. So his stuff is good. So, you know, thanks Bill for, well, I didn't ask, but I'm using them anyway. Your pictures of your products. Tom Daly, this is your official call out. Now we're not gonna be talking about the turbine side or the exhaust gas driven side of things a whole lot here because this is more of a discussion on how the boost actually adds up in these two different configurations. Let's start with the conventional twin turbo setup, the parallel turbos, when you have two that blow into a common plenum that, that goes into your throttle body and makes happy fun time. That's actually what Bill runs on his car. One feed and one on the compound, one plus one on the twin. So I chose this Garrett G40-1150 71 millimeter, more or less at random, but that's, you know, largely because Garrett actually does put out compressor maps that are useful and you don't have to do all kinds of wacky conversions to figure out the actual information you need. So Garrett claims that this one is good for 500 to 1,150 horsepower and displacement is two liters to six liters. I don't like that displacement specification that, that may have more to do with the turbine side of things, but from a compressor side, displacement doesn't really matter. What matters is horsepower, right? Because horsepower is a direct result of the amount of fuel you can burn to generate energy. And, and let's not get into the whole torque thing. I, I did that in another video and some people just can't wrap their heads around the fact that torque is a force, it does no work because there is no metric of distance attached to it at all. So forget that, get, get torque out of your mind. Horsepower is work, literally. It is a definition of work just like Watts is. But anyway, I'm not gonna go down that path again. I'll put a link in the description or someplace for, the, for that video if you wanna know more about it. But some people have a real hard time wrapping their heads around that concept. I honestly just don't know why, but Let's look at the compressor map for this turbo here. As you can see, the X axis is labeled in pounds per minute. Sorry, metric guys. This is one area where the imperial system of measurement is actually to our benefit because there is a good rule of thumb and it's generally pretty close. One pound of airflow per minute can support 10 horsepower. More or less. Sometimes you can get a little bit more out of it, assuming everything is efficient and in perfect working order, but more or less it's a 10 to one kind of thing. So if we look at the x-axis on this uh, compressor map, you can see like, let's pick 50 here. 50 is about equivalent to 500 horsepower. So if you have a 250 horsepower engine and you wanna make 500 horsepower, you need a two to one pressure ratio and that will put you right here, which is actually in a fairly happy place. And this turbo is just loafing along. It'll have no issue spooling up. 
assuming you get the turbine side kind of right. But again, I don't really care about that because I electrically drive my compressors. But that's generally the idea. And when you have conventional or parallel turbos, twin turbos, basically you just divide your motor horsepower in half. There is no additive boost per se. And by way of example, the best thing to do is to just pick a number and pick a destination and let's see what will be required, right? But let's say you have a 500 horsepower engine and you wanna make a thousand horsepower and you wanna use two of these. Well, you could use one of them. That thousand horsepower will be right at this hundred mark, more or less. And from a 500 horsepower engine to get to a thousand, you want a pressure ratio of two to one, two times 500 is a thousand. It's pretty straightforward, right? So you're gonna be down here though. This is not a happy place to be for this turbo. And why is it not a happy place to be? You see these kind of more or less horizontal lines that start taking a nosedive down? Well, where they start to take a nosedive down, that is called the choke region. And we have learned, like we have empirically proven that it takes a lot more power to drive the compressor wheel once you enter the choke region. We learned that by electrically driving the thing, you know, like it's real easy to drive it when you're in the happy place of the compressor map, but get all the way here to the choke side of things. This is the surge side where this, the compressor will flutter basically but this is the choke side where the compressor is having a hard time moving that much air at that particular pressure ratio and it takes a lot more energy to drive it and you can tell it also gets a lot less efficient when that happens and generally not a happy place to be so you can get to a thousand horsepower on one of these turbos but it's going to suck you're going to have a lot of heat to deal with you're gonna have a very slow spool up times, even if the turbine is sized right. So you would be much better off if you could be at 500 horsepower and a two to one. And how do you do that? Well, add a second turbo, basically. It's just really that simple, you know, because again, the pressure ratio is two to one and both would have the same pressure ratio. You know, atmospheric pressure is 14.7 PSI to one, but let's round for purposes of this whole discussion, let's just round it to 15 PSI. Yeah, mine shaft every day, right? Happy times. So you've got 500 horsepower and you're at a two to one pressure ratio. Both turbos will be loafing along right here, right in this part of the compressor map. And the nice thing is, if you wanna turn it up, it's real easy to do, right? Let's say your next target is 1500 horsepower, okay? So to get to 1500 horsepower, the pressure ratio doesn't change. It becomes three to one. So you're up here on this line right now, right? But half of 1500 horsepower, since you have two turbos, is 750. So 750 is here and three is here. You are definitely in the happy place for these turbos at 1500 horsepower. And again, you know, that would be to get to 1500 horsepower. It's a pressure ratio of three to one. That's about 30 PSI. It's actually a little bit less, obviously. 30 PSI, that'll get you there, right? That's parallel twin turbos. Who knew it was that simple, right? But now let's get into the real interesting stuff, the compound twins. So we've had a lot of success with our electric supercharger. We put a 12 second car into the high nines on pump gas with one of these things. But the problem is, as I mentioned before, we were operating in the choke region of the compressor map. And that's not a great place to be. Now, if we could be in a happier spot where it takes less drive energy to drive the electric superchargers, the impeller would spin at a faster speed because being motor driven and maxing out the motors, we really don't have any more power to spin the, the impeller faster. So we need to accomplish that by efficiency, right? So that, that's why I'm so keenly interested in this. But this is also really, really interesting because if you have one turbo blowing into another turbo, and let's say the first turbo makes 15 PSI and the second turbo makes 15 PSI, you would think, well, 30 PSI, right? Because you got 15 PSI and then another 15 PSI. Well, no, in fact, it's a lot better than that. So the way it works, and it's not immediately obvious because the immediate obvious solution is you just add the boost together like we just talked about. But when you think it through, it's pretty obvious. And with our electric superchargers, you know, the one that's actually affordable and you can fit in a car and financially make sense and all that, it'll generate relatively low boost. So if you want to achieve higher boost, I mean, when I say low boost, I'm talking like, you know, 
you might see six PSI out of it. But of course, again, for those of you who've missed it, we made way more power per PSI than I have made with any other forced induction system that I've worked on or been a part of for the last over, well, 30 years, to be honest. Picked up 200. 205 horsepower. To the tire. To the tire. Yeah. 205 to the tire. The math doesn't even work. So this is how it works. So let's assume you have two identically sized compressors or turbos. These are not sequential turbos, you know, they do that to get away from lag and so you can basically have a turbo with a wider range, but we're not even going into that because there is no real additive stuff. But when you have one turbo blowing into another, you could have them the same size and there's no drawback. Well, again, if they're electrically driven, there's no drawback. But let's say for the sake of argument, because it makes the math easy and it makes this whole thing easier to understand, each one of these compressors can generate 15 PSI on our sample engine, right? So you've got 15 PSI from one blowing into the inlet of the second one, and that one also can generate 15 PSI. So you're starting out at a pressure ratio of two to one, okay? Now that two to one is already compressed to two to one, obviously. So the second turbo or compressor is not seeing sea level pressure or 15 PSI, again, approximately. It's now seeing 30 PSI, but it thinks that 30 PSI is its base level. So you take 30 PSI and you run it through the compressor and develop a pressure ratio of two to one once again. You now are doubling 30 PSI, not 15. So that 30 PSI becomes 60 PSI. And from that 60 PSI, you simply subtract the ambient pressure of 15 PSI in our example, and you end up with 45 PSI. So instead of 15 PSI and 15 PSI giving you 30 PSI, 15 PSI into another 15 PSI gives you 45 PSI. That doesn't suck. Now, there are gonna be some losses. Every time you compress a gas, it heats up. You know, and the same thing here. So let's say in reality, you're probably looking more like at 40 PSI. Still significantly better than 30 PSI, wouldn't you say? And the same math will apply for our relatively low pressure ratio, but highly efficient electric superchargers. And the beauty is you don't have to run plumbing to it. You don't have to run a belt to it. You can just put one into another, into another, into another until the world implodes. Can't do that with other things. Now, you know, this is the theory. And the one question that immediately pops into my mind is that while a centrifugal compressor like a turbo or a centrifugal supercharger is a true compressor in and of itself, its internal compression ratio is actually pretty low. So the boost that you see when you start getting to these uh, pressure ratios of two or three or four is basically restriction. It's, it's, a, it's the engine is functioning as a restriction. Now, does that mean that the internal compression ratio of the turbo or centrifugal supercharger is what follows that fun math that builds more boost? Or is it the whole kit and caboodle, the whole back pressure system? Well, there's been no good way to test this. Well, up until now anyway, because you know, what are you gonna do, fab up like a 15 different turbo setups on a, on a dyno? That, would take forever. Nobody's going to take that kind of time to do it. But since I do have all the parts in the, you know, nightmare that is currently Alex Labs for three electric superchargers, we're going to be able to test that. So hopefully we're going to be the first people to actually test this theory in the very near future, I'm still debating whether I want to buy a dyno or whether I want to strike a deal with a dyno company. Um, but definitely, please, you know, subscribe, hit a like, because all of that stuff is going to help me because, you know, more views, more motivation, more, you know, then I'd be much more OK with spending the tens of thousands of dollars it costs to buy a dyno. And we can actually test this thing. And those of you who've stuck with me, particularly through last year, where I think I only put out like four videos because, well, of this whole thing, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your support. I appreciate you coming along for the ride. Hopefully this has been informative, and I'll catch you all in the next one.
And now here's a moment of Roger. One feet and one on the compound. One plus one on the twins. It all adds up. 